What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. You're listening to episode 278. I am your host, Greg. I am here tonight with Tyler. Ryan should join us again next week. Uh, we got a quick episode to bang out. There was some news in Red Wings land. Uh, we've been off for about a week, uh, but there was a signing in Detroit. There was a signing in Grand Rapids. There's some signing rumors floating around, and then something really disappointing happened this week. Uh, but Tyler, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, finally got everything I need to do wor- done work-wise, so I'll be around a lot more now other than my vacation that's coming up at some point here. So um looking forward to talking some hockey, looking forward to talking some Red Wings hockey, even though there's not a whole lot to talk about just yet. Although I have a feeling over the next week to 10 days, we're going to start getting a lot more conversation about the Red Wings and the 20. 20- 30, sorry, 30 other teams that have been eliminated from the Stanley Cup playoffs and the ones that obviously didn't qualify. So it's, uh, mean, it's all uphill from here. You mean after the here. Uh, Edmonton Oilers get swept by the Florida Panthers? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I think I think you're going to get Edmonton's best effort. I don't know if that's going to be good enough, but if they can't win game three, it's over. So if they win game three, they might be in the series. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you be right i I don't see that happening just because it's super rare that you see a sweep in the nhl but i mean the florida panthers kind of have a a stranglehold on that series right now well we're going to start off with a signing that did happen last week the detroit red wings signed left wing jacob richlovsky to a two-year entry level contract Last season, he played with, oh, God, um, a team in the Czech League, uh, the Billy Tigre Liberec team in the Czech League. I Maybe that's how you say it. Uh, 2023-24, he had 51 games played, 26 goals, 20 assists for 46 points. He is a 5'10", 181-pound left wing. Uh, as according to elite prospects, people find different heights and weights, but it's all around pretty close. Uh, he's 22 years old and I watched some tape on him. I mean, he has a really good shot uh, for being a shorter guy. He's not afraid to use his body. He's not afraid to be physical. He, uh, the highlights I watched of him, he was breaking through defenders again. He's in the Czech league. He's playing against men, which is nice. But the big thing is is his production from 2022-23 to 2023-24. In 2022-23, in 52 games played, he only had five goals and 12 assists for 17 points. So to play one less game this season, but to have 46 points up from 17 is pretty big. And in nine playoff games this season, he had seven points, five goals and two assists. Now, do I expect him to start the season in Detroit? No, not unless we're offloading a bunch of people and we've got spots to fill. I expect him to start probably in Grand Rapids, maybe really prove that he can translate what is now his newfound offensive touch to American ice. And if he performs at that high of a level in Grand Rapids, then maybe you can slide him over. He can play a a fill in for whenever someone gets injured. But again, I think it's just building pieces, taking chances on guys that don't really cost you anything. And it seemed like, hey, maybe it finally clicked. Because for some players, Tyler, right, it's just like one season, they're just like average, and then it just it clicks. And then they're good from that point out. Kind of like ta- that kind of happened to Tage Thompson, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Tage Thompson um, was one of those guys that I feel like even a lot of people, when, when Buffalo traded for him in the O'Reilly deal, he was the major part of that O'Reilly deal, if you remember correctly. And I think the first like year, year and a half, he was playing bottom pair, I think he was in Rochester for a little bit at one point too. And then it all kind of clicked. It all it just all at once it all kind of clicked. And now he's a number one center and and he's actually probably a top top ten to top fifteen center in the NHL. So um hell of a player. And uh that's that's one of those things. It's like when you're in the situation that the Red Wings are in, you have to be able to hit on some of these flyers. Um not no pun intended, but it's it feels like if you're gonna if you're gonna get to the point where you want to get to, you're gonna have to get lucky at some point because you didn't get lucky in the lottery. And I'm not saying that Rich Lobsky is going to be a lottery player or anything to that effect at all. But if you get anything out of him offensively, 
Um, if he turns into a 20 goal scorer, 15 goal scorer, you'll take that because you need that. Um, depth scoring is, is a prop wasn't really a problem last year, but has been a problem previously. And you can never have enough scoring in this league, especially in a league that continues to, to outscore itself year after year after year over the last couple of years. So, um, if he can score and he can, he can produce offensively there'll be a spot for him either in the lineup in Detroit or in the lineup somewhere else in the NHL yeah maybe he turns him and I mean this is again just spitballing because he has no North American experience but even if he does turn himself into a Robbie Fabry style player and but he's only 22 maybe that fits the timeline a little bit better you get a bottom six scoring piece that hasn't had health issues though Robbie Fabry was pretty healthy uh, last season but Robbie Fabry is older, so you're getting younger and you're bringing in talent. The move could also be to, again, with another move that was made uh, just today, the Griffins signed forward Gabriel Sang- uh, Sager to a, a contract for next season. So it seems like some moves might be made to bolster the Griffins for a couple different reasons. So either they plan on graduating some rookies, and these are going to be fill-ins for some guys like maybe a Mazer, maybe a Marco Casper, uh, Albert Johansson, though they haven't signed a defenseman lately. But maybe these are moves so that they can bring guys from Grand Rapids into the Detroit lineup, and you're backfilling with what seem like pretty competent players. I mean, Seeger is, uh, shout out to Lars, apparently he was one of Lars' students at one point uh, in Sweden because he's from Sweden. Uh, but he's 24 years old. He's six foot four, 209 pound. And he's listed as a center slash winger played for uh wore the a for Cornell this past season, 2023, 24 and 35 games played had 14 goals, 30 assists for 44 points. He went to college for five years, started at union college in 2019, 20, and just ended at Cornell in 2023, 24. And again, it just seems like depth, a depth offensive piece for the Griffins That way, in scenario one for me, is maybe you end up promoting a couple guys to Detroit. Yeah, I mean, that that would be in a perfect world. Like, do you bring up back a guy like Patrick Kane? But you want to make some room for a guy like, um, you know, Carter Mazur. uh, You know, Nate Danielson is obviously going to push. Marco Casper likely should be on the team. Um, but has Danielson passed them up? That's another question that, you know, I mean, they play the same position, essentially. I know Danielson, a lot of people have said, you know, his fastest way to the lineup is potentially at the wing position, but, um, you know, I mean, Danielson's one of those guys that I feel like at 19 or 20 years old, um, could jump right into the NHL and, and make an impact. So obviously we'll see what happens with that. But them signing guys for Grand Rapids tells me one thing, one or two things. One, that they're graduating guys that are going to play on the wings next year, or they're getting ready to make a trade. Yeah, that was my uh, part B. (laughs) So optimistic part is we're going to see some prospects make the Red Wings. The other side of it is, again, maybe conversations with Jonathan Berggren aren't going anywhere. So maybe they've got, they're thinking, oh, well, hey, maybe if we sign a Richlovsky to kind of sure up that part of it, we can trade Berggren and and recoup something, get, put him in a goldie trade or get some picks for him or move up in the draft. Same thing with signing Gabriel Seeger. Maybe you do the same thing. Maybe you're saying, hey, some forwards, we got to make some trades here. We need fill in for that. So I think on either count, though, it's, it's a good sign, right? Red Wings need to make some trades this off season. Whether There's going to be some moves this off season. I think we can all to lighten up the roster. We can exactly lighten up the roster, but I think we can all understand there. You can't run back the same group that you had last year. And no. like, it was a good group. It had its, it had its moments for sure. But at the end of the day, and we're not saying run... tear it down. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. You need to, you need to be able to, See see the progress that you had in a lot of the younger guys. See the, the players that, that develop, that, that fit in the group, that, that you're looking to continue to get better with. And then see what you can do to augment that group and make that group a little bit better, better more sound defensively. And I say defensively loud because that is one of the, 
biggest issues that they had last year, especially in, on that, what was it, 10-game losing streak, 11-game losing streak, whatever it was there, that kind of derailed the whole season. That is imperative that they find a way to be better defensively, whether it be um, on defense or at the forward position as well. Because, you know, they, they do have some liabilities uh, off defensively um, for forwards. You know, Patrick Kane is not exactly – a great defensive forward at this stage of his career. Not that he ever really was, but certainly not at this stage of his career. Um, Lucas Raymond's getting better at it. You know, that there's, there's some progress being made on the roster itself, especially with the younger guys. Um, but even on defense, you know, the defense, you know, you can't trot out Jeff Petrie out there every single night. And Justin Hall, I know he didn't play a whole lot. Ben Chirot was a lot better last year. Um, but even Shane Gosses Bear, are you bringing him back? Probably not, right? So there's going to be a spot no. there at, def- at defense. So sorry, I kind of went off a, on a tangent there, but I think that if you're going to be a better group, you you can't come back with the same guys. You obviously don't want to tear it down. You just kind of you kind of need to push the right buttons. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, maybe you kind of say, hey, our our bottom six, even though we have a lot of bottom six players, maybe our bottom six isn't a hundred percent working. And we can move a few pieces around to maybe get a little bit bigger. Maybe you can trade, like I said, a Robbie Fabry and maybe add some size there, some some grit. You absolutely, I think, and we've talked about this, need a top six forward. I think that's an absolute need. Whether that is re-signing, that's re-signing Patrick Kane and adding another is what that is. Yep. You need to improve yep. the defense. You need a top four defenseman. Can Albert Johansson come in and be a top four defenseman? We don't know. If you could run with it and you said that Jake Wallman and Mo Sider was still your top pair, but your second pair was uh, Edmondson Johansson, like they played in Grand Rapids, and that was solid, then you're, then you're a lot better. If Jeff Petrie is an everyday player on this team next season, you've got some issues. So you need to trade a hole. You need to buy out a, a, a hole, maybe. Maybe you buy out a Jeff Petrie. I, I'm not really comfortable paying whole that much money to sit to be a seventh defenseman, but maybe you pay that really cheap contract to Jeff Petrie to be a seventh defenseman in case someone gets injured, he can fill in. But like you said, you can't just run it back. Same with goaltender. And we talked about it last week. You need to kind of, you need to uh, address the goaltender situation, whether that's through trade or free agency. And then there's rumors that come up about players that the Red Wings might be interested. Um, but what we're going to do first, we're going to take a break. Then we'll come back and talk about those rumors. We're going to do a quick message from DraftKings. And I we'll got talk one just quick yeah. thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and I, I try not to get on Steve Eisenman, just as I tried not to get on Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. And it, uh, eventually it ended up working for Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. Kind of a Big similar difference, situation. Tyler. Huge difference. Yeah, but kind of. Kind of a, a similar situation where a homegrown son is coming back home to try and deliver a championship. As, as that's the comparison I make. Now with Eisenman, I try not to get on him because I, I feel like most of the buttons he's pressed is good. These two have not been good. The 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 Sherratt one is okay. Okay, it's it's not great, but it's okay. The Hall one has been an absolute disaster from the day that it was signed. And you just knew that that's how it was going to happen. And a lot of people are no, like, no, oh, we didn't just... know. We came in reserved. We said we were going to wait and not say anything terrible about Justin Hole until we saw him played. It turns out that everybody was correct. He's horrible. He's worse than Sherratt ever was, even when Sherratt was terrible. He's terrible. He gets turned. He's, he's just not a good defenseman. And I think can't play Petrie's him. worse. Petrie is worse, but how by how much? I mean, uh, at least Petrie's experienced and at one point was actually a decent defenseman. Like when he was with the Canadians and he was with um, Edmonton, he was actually a pretty damn good defenseman. Like he was an underrated defenseman. Obviously, not like a top top ten or top fifteen defenseman in the NHL, but he was probably a top forty, top forty five defenseman in the NHL at his peak. He was a really good offensive defenseman, and at times he was really good defensively too. Obviously, father time has caught up to him. Injuries injuries have caught up to him, all that stuff. But Justin Hall just, I don't feel like has ever been a great defenseman. Um, and, and I think we're finally starting to see that. I know 
we we as a podcast agreed to come in a little bit reserved. I remember when the signing was made that I was like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me. And I feel like Eiserman made that that deal knowing that we needed depth, but I don't I don't know. That one never really made sense from the beginning. Obviously, general managers aren't going to hit on every excuse me every single signing, so. I'm not going to complain too much there, but that is one that I 100% put on Steve Eisenman. Or maybe it wasn't specifically Eisenman's decision, and it was the analytics department or somebody that happened to like Justin Hall, but I don't see it. I don't think you see it, and most of the fan base doesn't see it. So could you buy him out? Maybe. I mean, but I think you can trade him to someone like the San Jose Sharks. Yeah, you might be able to do that. Yeah, Utah, I think Utah or San Jose, you could make a case for one of the bottom teams where Justin Hole would still help them, like whether it's just provide a, a steady-ish defenseman on the back, nothing stellar. But I don't think, if I was buying someone out, I would buy out Jeff Petrie simply because it'd be the cheapest option. But I think you can find a trade partner for Justin Hole. But that's, I think, besides the point. We're going to take a quick break. Word from DraftKings. We'll come back. We're going to talk about some rumors uh, that are floating around, plus something that made us really angry this week. So uh, hold tight for one minute, and we will be right back. We're this close to crowning the Stanley Cup champion, and with the action heating up on the ice, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least 5 bucks, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. One no sweat bet per new customer issued as one bonus bet based on amount of initial losing bet. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash ice for eligibility, wagering and deposit restrictions, terms and responsible gaming resources. Copyright NHL 2024, all rights reserved. And we're back. And there's some, uh, it's, it's silly season. So there's rumors floating around now. Uh, Red Wings prospects at LGRW prospects on Twitter. If you're not following them, uh, they're excellent. They do all the prospect updates from all over the place. Uh, fantastic to interact with. They've always been really cool. And they posted that a clip from Friday where Shaw from Canuck Central says he's heard a rumor that Detroit could be in on Dakota Joshua at around $4 million AAV. Now, if you're not familiar with Dakota Joshua, he is played on Vancouver. He is a center. He is 28 years old. He is six foot three, 206 pounds in last season with the Canucks in 63 games played. Had 18 goals, 14 assists for 32 points. The season before that, he played 79 games with 11 goals and 12 assists. For 23 points, the only difference is that in 2022-23, when the Canucks were bad, he was a minus 16. And in 2023-24, when the Canucks were good, he was a plus 19. That's why plus minus is not an individual stat. It is more of a team stat because when the team around you is good, you will generally be more on the positive side. Am I okay with Dakota Joshua? Sure. I'm okay with him if you get rid of both Joe Valeno and Robbie Fabry. You get rid of a center, and you get rid of contract money. Um, $4 million to me for what Dakota Joshua provides, especially coming off of a good run with the Canucks on a good Canucks team for this season, it, it doesn't do nothing for me. I, there's zero wiggle for me there. I don't understand why that would be a thing, especially like when we talked about earlier, you got Marco Casper, who I think could come in and do the exact same thing that Dakota Joshua does for far cheaper because he's on an entry level contract and probably put up the same. I mean, that's like a half a point per game player. I don't know why you, you don't think Marco Casper could be that if maybe a little bit lower, but cheaper and far younger. I just, 
maybe they're saying it just to say it. I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it. it does, that's not a fit. Um, if you want to talk Stamkos, you want to talk Jake Gensel, you want to talk high-end forward X. Give me names that can, make me excited. We can have a conversation. Dakota Joshua, would he be a good Red Wing? Sure. On the wing, bottom six? Sure, fine, fine. Not at $4 million, not at $4.5 million. Um, Not doing that, not doing that, and not doing that. It just doesn't make sense. Um, for a team that is headed in the right direction to yet again make a signing that sets you back again. Because I don't think that, what is he, 27, 28? Yeah, he's 28 years old. He will yeah, be, uh, I, he was, so, so here's the connection. He was born in Dearborn, so he's a Michigan guy. Uh, but he was born in May, so uh, he, he's like freshly 28. Okay, great. And he's an Ohio State grad, so I'm out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he is an Ohio State grad. I know. I knew you were was a pretty say good that, player. And I cut at that Ohio out of State. the screenshots. But I mean, the the thing is with him, he's a good player. Like, yes, if you signed him for two point five million for a couple of years, okay, now I'm in because now you're getting bigger in the bottom six you're not giving up too much to get him in terms of, of, of salary yearly, but you're not going to get him for 2.5. Some other team is going to overpay and then you're going to have to match it. And I don't think the wings are in the position to be doing that. If you're going to swing, you might as well swing big. You might as well swing in the stamp coast. You might as well swing in the Gensel. You might as well swing in those ballparks. Why not? What do you have to lose at this point? Stamp coast would be a, one of those guys that like, could mentor Dylan Larkin, right? Could mentor a Lucas Raymond. Could mentor X forward on this team. The and same reason that Patrick Kane is important. Exactly. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people say, okay, you, you bring Kane back, that takes you out of the Stamkos. I don't think it does. You'd have to make a few. Like, like we said, you need two top six. You would need a top six forward. If Kane leaves, you need two. Now, Kane and Stamkos would be your two. I'm just, I'm weary about how the money works there and how, especially with Raymond and Sider still not signed. Now, there were conversations that um, the agent for Raymond and Patrick Kane, I believe, are the same agent. Uh, they had contract talks this week. So, uh, same with David Perron. There were contract talks this week. And something could move. I actually think uh, my prediction was Raymond is probably the first to sign. And I don't need Mo David Sider. Perron back if I'm being 100% honest. I, I, I said Kane or Perron, probably not both. Perron, I could swap Perron for Mazer and not lose any sleep probably. But I think yeah. what Dakota Joshua brings to the lineup is, I think if they're looking at him from a standpoint of he prob he brings physicality. So he had four fights last season should probably in jail, uh, be in jail for elder abuse for fighting Mark Giordano. Um, <laughs> no, he actually had, so his first fight of 2023 was in January. So that was the season before. So yeah, he had four fights in the 2023, 24 season. He brings the size. He brings the, I guess, aggressiveness, but that, that cap hit to me. And they did say that the cap is going up to 88 million. It was, it was thought it might be a little bit lower. Um, but it's going to be a little bit higher than it was originally projected. Escrow's still, paid off now, too, by the way. Yeah, still at that, though, with the $4 million is just, it's too much. And like you said, I think Dakota Joshua at a maximum of, like, $3 million would be my cap for him. No, and you know what my cap would be? Two and a half. My, my cap would be the Michael Rasmussen contract, $3.2 million. That would be my max. Yeah, Michael Rasmussen has what what the uh, the words we like to use the intangibles, where like he's a locker room guy. Everyone in that locker room loves Michael Rasmussen. Uh, he's becoming a leader in the locker room, and that everyone wants to play with him. So I think that that would be. You're right. I think three point two is probably a good deal. Uh, would probably be a good deal for someone like Dakota Joshua, especially in the position you're going to play him in. Yeah, and and I mean, again, there could still be offensive upside. I mean, he had 18 goals this year. You know, could he get another 10 and be in that 28 to 30 ballpark? Who knows? Um, you know, it, he seems like the kind of guy that is pretty versatile. Uh, 
in the lineup where he could play with a guy like Pedersen, but he could also play on the fourth line. Um, in Detroit, he could play with a guy like Larkin, or he could play on the fourth line or third line. Um, but I don't want to do that again. I want a solid top six. I don't want to do the whole, we have to shoehorn David Perron to the top line because we don't have any other option. I feel like having flexibility is important, though, too. So if you signed a J- Dakota Joshua and, and the first line's not going, you can slide Joshua up there just to push the piano, not not to use a Zetterberg Datsuk. God damn um, it. Just an applicator with with number eight there, the, the name that we shall not say. But, um, you know, I mean, there is value in, in having flexibility by being able to play up and down the lineup um, because we all know injuries happen. Right. We all know people's games go to hell sometimes. And we all know sometimes just a shake up of the lineup and the lines themselves um, can help things out. I'm not saying that I'm 100% in on Dakota Joshua, but if you're telling me you're getting him at $3.2 million for four or five years, I'm in. Yeah, I'm trying to look up his most recent contract. So he's coming off of a $825,000 contract with the Vancouver Canucks. It is insane to me. Insane to think that you go from $825,000 to $4 million with the difference in production that you did uh, let's see. You got uh, nine more points, nine more points from the season before, and that's worth a, like a three million dollar, three point two million dollar raise. I don't think that's feasible at all. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know where they're getting the four four million or four point five million, but that's that's a little bit steep for Dakota Joshua. Like I said, the three point two million dollars is probably the most I would go or if you had to go three point two five, I'd be OK with that. Anything more than that, I'm out. Yeah, and and I just pulled up Evolving Hockey really quick to see what their contract projection on him was. They have him signing a predicted uh, two-year contract at $2.056 million. At that number, at all day, great. Give Dakota Joshua $2 million to just beat the shit out of people in the bottom six. I have no issue with that. And chip in offensively, half a point per game player in the bottom six, perfectly fine. Let's do it all day. At $2 million, yep. not double that. Yep. I agree. Cool. So we're going to get to the last subject of the night. Actually, first, before we do that, uh, just an announcement. The Detroit Red Wings uh, draft party is on the 28th. There will be live music. There will be street hockey. There will be games and alumni autographs. But this year, you have to get a ticket because it is $5. They are charging for the draft party this year. $5. Thank you, Illiches. Uh, but that that is make sure you do that, because if you show up without a ticket before it used to be like, OK, they would just like do the wand and we'll have you walk through the metal detector and you'd be fine. Now they're going to be scanning because it actually costs money. So they said you're going to be able to go watch the draft from lower bowl of the arena if you want to go inside. Uh, I will be there, I believe I might be there with my daughter. So we'll see. She said she wants to go, but I think she'll get bored. Um, but it, I will be there, but it is five bucks a person. And I think it's children under three or free or something like that. I don't know why you'd everybody should be free. That's fucking bullshit that they're actually it should be. For it. Yep. Ridiculous. We don't have a top 10 pick and now they're charging, which is insane to me. Okay. So but th- sub- here's this should be, the, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry to cut you off, but this is a marketing event. This is how you, this is like, it's supposed to be outside a hype, of hype outside of going to a game outside of going to a preseason game outside of going to training camp this is like a a, almost a marketing event where you're like okay here's the young guys you're playing street hockey fans engaged in the off season when there's no hockey going on for us but not only that but you keep the fans engaged i'm sure there's signage everywhere of, of the players and blah 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 maybe even get a player there too um but like for that to not be, I mean, I'm sure it's not expensive to go, but like the, it's the point of the matter. It's like, you're going from to $5. Is it $5? Is that what you said? Yeah. Five bucks. It's cheap, but it's like, then you got to pay for parking likely. Right. So it's like, it's more than $5. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's just my, actually, I think moment. last time I went, uh, the actual LCA garage parking was free. 
Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then if it's free parking and it's five dollars, then I guess it's not that big of a deal because they do have to pay the staff to be there and all that stuff. So I, I guess I, I, I kind of understand it, but at the same time, it's like this organization and you, you, they can sit here and tell you anything they want to. Um, they do with the Tigers and and say, you know, all these owners are crying poor in baseball and 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 you know. Some in the NHL, although there's a cap, so there's there's not really as many talking about it. Don't let them kid you. you they have billions of dollars, and they don't need the extra five dollars. But hey, it's 2024. Everything gets more and more expensive, not cheaper. So this is where we're at. But the point of the matter is, go to the draft party if you can. It's a good thing to go to. Uh, obviously, they don't have a top five, top five or top ten pick, but you could see a trade. Um, and and it's a good time to meet some people there as well. You can meet me. I'll probably have stickers, so come see me. I'm gonna get some more stickers printed. I think so. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, but the last thing we want to close tonight out with is the uh, absolute abomination of news that came out that the Washington Capitals will be purchasing. Actually, have purchased. Uh, one of our most used sites, Cat Friendly, and we'll be shutting it down July 5th. They're going to keep Cat Friendly open through free agency, and then it will be shut down. And we thought, hey, that's kind of a dick move on the Capitals. Like, why are they doing this? And then Elliot Friedman put out 32 thoughts, and Steve Dangle, uh, shout out to Steve Dangle, also quoted it. Uh, he said, listen to uh, Elliot Friedman's report about the NHL being icy with Cat Friendly and not wanting the salary info to be public. Uh, Steve says they should release this information themselves, and they don't. Once again, this is the NHL telling its most passionate fans to shut up and eat their slop. Also, our friend NHL Watcher over on Twitter said that basically what Friedman said is the NHL frowns on the existence of sites like Cat Friendly. Even though they should be doing it themselves, they consider it proprietary information. So even if the Capitals wanted to, they couldn't keep it open. The league would say you cannot be a partner to this and uh, and have it be public. And also, you couldn't make any money from it on ads. So once the Caps purchased it, they had to shut it down. And to me, I understand from the point where some people are saying, and Sean Shapiro said that the Caps were thinking about hiring a couple people to like do this for them, but they just saw Cap Friendly and the infrastructure is already there, and the, all they needed now basically hire is a what do they need person. from it, though? I don't understand well, what they need from it. So a lot of teams had also said, and, and Sean Shapiro said the same, te- same thing, is that a lot of teams said that buying Cat Friendly for them would be a waste because they already have software and a system that does this, and that the NHL provides them with the cap data. But it's basically just have a database so that when they're doing trades and they're trying to look for comparables and they're trying to figure out uh, doing deals with agents, what the player's next cap hit should be. They have a whole database of players that they can compare against. The problem is for, and, and I don't know why, my my guess about the the NHL not wanting it to be like public info is that so people stop bitching about stuff like cap circumvention and they want to keep stuff private just like they keep it. I can understand keeping injuries private, but keeping cap hit private doesn't make any sense to me. What it takes away from is people like us, like content creators who rely heavily on being like, oh, hey, look, this person just signed for this much money. Let's look at comparable contracts. Was that a good deal? Was it a bad deal? Should we be mad about it? Should we like it? And there are other sites to do it. Uh, I think we're going to be talking from uh, to some people from Puckpedia, who's now going to be basically the go-to place to get your cap information. I just don't understand why, and it, it's Gary Bettman, and we hate him and we want him gone and should have been gone a long time ago that just continuously shows his ass by making like putting out stuff like this saying no we want it all to be private we're like but hey guys like we this stuff that we cover like we like to keep everyone informed we like to know what's going on like i don't i don't know why you as the nhl wouldn't just add this to your website like it's easy yeah i think that there's a reason why that they don't do it uh, obviously, it's that information that they they think it's proprietary. I think you, I think honestly, it's better the way it is in terms of Puckpedia, in terms of Cap Cap friendly, in terms of Cap Geek when Cap Geek was around. Um, because I feel like R.I.P. Dude from Cap Geek. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, Matthew Woost died on March 19th, 2015, at the age of 35 due to colon cancer. Yeah, it's too bad. Um, I rem- and I remember when, when Cap Geek was shutting down, Cap Friendly came out a couple weeks later, a couple months later. So I would I would expect that Puckpedia will be the lead leading um website, but we could see something pop up, you know, soon sooner rather than later. Um uh Elliot Friedman said that he thinks Sportsnet should do something like that, where where they put it on their website. That would be the best. Just some big company just come in and do it. Like we go all over the internet for stats. And I'm surprised some of the guys like the evolving hockey guys haven't just went and scraped the entire site and added it to theirs because there's value in it. Like we do a lot. I spend actually cat friendly out of all the sites we use. And I use a combination of, we, we pay for probably six different stat sites and I spend the most amount of time on cat friendly. And we were going back and forth with someone and they said like the average user, like, spends 14 minutes on that website when they went from when they land on the website to when they leave is 14 minutes. If you're not in like marketing and you're not in like um, the business of like running websites, that's a long time. Like advertisers love it when someone's on your, your site for more than like two minutes. And dude, I'm telling you right now, like I work in insurance and hopefully my boss doesn't ever hear this, but you know, at work, I always have it up. I always I like in a, in a minimized window I always have it up and so especially not every single day but when when it you know the trade deadline comes up and 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 you know they talk about trades and that's the that other thing it was the up. best resource the best resource to look at trade history yep. you could go to google and type in Steve Eiserman trade history and the first link is a cat friendly link with literally Every trade Steve Eiserman has made as a general manager. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I agree. And and we're going to miss that. But I'm telling you right now, someone's already thinking of making one. There's already got to be some wheels in motion right now um, with another website. Obviously, you said Puckpedia could be potentially um, revamping their site and probably making it look a little bit more like Cap Friendly did or Cap Geek did back in the day. So, um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Obviously, it's kind of a blow to the hockey community because it's like it's one of those things that people use all the time. Like, I'm telling you right now, as a hockey nerd, um, you know, I don't just watch the Red Wings. I'll be 100% honest. I watch the whole NHL and, um, you know, I, I watch the playoffs through and through. I watch pretty much every game. I'm, I would, I'm what you would call a hockey sicko. Between hockey and college football, I probably watch more more than anything else in the world. And I have Cap Friendly up all the time. I'm always looking at things. Oh, well, what, what would this trade look like if the Wings did it? Uh, what would the Cap what, – what would your your plan for the 2024 offseason look like? You know, you could go in and do that, and you can save How it. How far over go back uh, the Cap it. or the Toronto Maple Leafs today? Like <laughs> – yeah, I mean, and it's a good resource to have. It's too bad that it's going away, but I can tell you right now, the wheels have to be in motion already with either a big corporation or a couple of guys that are like, you know what, let's do this and get rich again. I mean, it, it, it's one of those things. It's like, it feels like maybe it's a one-time thing in terms of, of, of cap friendly, like the way it was sold to an NHL team. The other thing that I have, and it's kind of a developing thought. I know you said that the NHL has somewhat of an infrastructure. I don't understand why they don't have a full infrastructure like an Exos. Like in, in football, in college football in the NFL, they have Exos, which is like their their software that they use, that the plays are all on, the film's all on there. You can go in and, you know, people that know football can – know exactly what I'm talking about or work in football, know exactly what I'm talking about. Why does the NHL not have a, a software like that where it's like, okay, here's all the trades that have ever happened. Here are the stats. Here's here. Here's this. Here's that. I know it's probably up to the teams, but why doesn't the league just take it over and say, hey, look, this is what we're going to do for internal purposes only. We're going to have this. And then whoever wants to make an external cap geek, cap friendly, puckpedia, x website can do that on their own 
and the teams are going to give the, the cap friendly or whatever company the information. So why do these, why does the NHL so reluctant? I don't get it. I understand it from if, if that's the hill they're going to die on with, with the whole proprietary information. They don't want uh, players' salaries to be on the website, but they're already on the website anyways. They tweet it out. When, when somebody gets signed, they tweet out, oh, he, such and such re-signs six-year extension. And then Elliot Friedman tweets out the, the salary five minutes later. It's already out there. It's already information that we have. So why are they so reluctant? I don't I don't understand it. I don't get it. Uh, well, now I'm just going to have to track it myself and just be really sad because it's it, it made it so easy. And now, like you said, Puckpedia is out there. I have to get used to a whole new interface. They're going to have to do some updates and some some additions. And it's just it's making it harder from a league who is already trying to continuously remove stuff from the the ability for fans to access it. It's just you you think you'd want to expand it, but instead it seems that um, the that Gary Bettman is intent on keeping it as small and shrinking it as as much as possible instead of just opening it up to everyone like he should be doing. I think that the NHL, if they were to do it, it wouldn't be as detailed. It wouldn't be as as user friendly. I think it would just be kind of clunky, just like the NHL website is. So I feel like the best way to do it is to have somebody else recreate cap friendly or something to that sort. Uh, hopefully Puckpedia will be the guys um, and we'll just see what happens. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, thank you for listening to us rant. Tyler, I want to get your final thoughts before we sign off. Yeah, final thoughts are enjoy the rest of the Stanley Cup playoffs, whatever's left of it. Um, And, I mean, there's going to be information. There's going to be information in the next week to 10 days, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. And uh, you're going to start hearing stuff about the Red Wings. You're going to start hearing stuff about extensions, Lucas Raymond, Moritz Sider will probably be the first names that you do here. Resigning, obviously, you'll hear some UFA stuff July 1. So, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Obviously, the Griffins were eliminated, the Walleye were eliminated, so there's nothing really left uh, to talk Red Wings other than the offseason. So, you can follow me on Twitter at SealDog91. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, go check out our stuff at Vintage Detroit. Go to Vintage Detroit Collection. Uh, you can go to their website, click on the Keep It Local tab. We are up there. We've got some shirts that are up there for sale. And uh, yeah, go ahead and buy some. Uh, it supports the show, keeps the lights on. I think we're going to start a Patreon, too, going into next season when we will probably be dropping two episodes a week. My plan, I think, is two episodes a week during the season, one episode a week during the off season, just to keep everybody informed. Well, the season is dead and there's not much going on. We don't have a ton to talk about. Uh, but you can follow me online at Breaking the Wing. You can follow the Grindline Podcast online at Grindline Pod. We give a shout out to the Hockey Podcast Network for hosting us and spreading our podcast around. Like I said, Vintage Detroit, which is the only place you should get your Detroit jerseys from and worked on. Uh, and yeah, I think that's uh, you can follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to us. Turn on those notifications. We get notified every time an episode goes live. But that's into it for us tonight. So for Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy, Hockey Town.